Well, I'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I know uh, some additional participants are joining us, but let's just get started. Um, welcome to our seminar today, during which uh, we will hear from two organizations, a pharmacy benefit manager, Prime Therapeutics, and a health plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, on how they have been collaborating during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as some of the challenges and the successes that they have had. Uh, my name is Punar Karajamandic. I am the C. Arthur Williams Junior Professor of Healthcare Risk Management in the Department of Finance at the Carlson School of Management. And I'm also the Academic Director of the Medical Industry Leadership Institute, or in our words, our MELI, uh, uh, that is hosting this uh, event. Our guests today are David Lassen, who is the Chief Clinical Officer of Prime Therapeutics, and Randy Hanna, who's the Vice President of Pharmacy in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. So this event in particular uh, that Mili is hosting is, a, is an event that is a part of a series organized by members of the Business School Alliance for Health Management, or BAM, to bring together the business leaders and, and scholars in virtual events during COVID-19 uh, to discuss some of the timely and relevant issues on how COVID-19 has disrupted the healthcare marketplace and the different sectors of the marketplace and how it is shaping the future of different sectors in healthcare. Business School Alliance for Health Management, 20 member schools, as you can see here in this slide, comprise some of the leading US and global business schools with a health sector focus. Uh, now our members are located all across the United States, Canada, Latin America, Europe, and Africa. And these member schools that you see are committed to cultivating and promoting a solid understanding of healthcare management policy and innovation through their educational collaborations, research, and other initiatives. And the institute that I lead, Millie, is a proud member of this amazing business group community and the Business School Alliance. So today, I look forward to a very insightful conversation with our guests, David, David and Randy, to hear about how their organizations responded to COVID-19. So to give a background of why we wanted to talk about this is, you know, the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I guess the current days of the COVID-19 pandemic as well, is an environment where we have rapidly changing information about potential, uh, potential pharmaceutical treatments, their benefits and risks. And so in addition, there is also a continuous involvement on both the state and local government policies as well as the federal policies. And many states, for example, issued legislative mandates uh, related to prescribing and coverage of various treatments. Um, hydroxychloroquine, as one example, was regulated in some states in response to the fears that, that not enough would be available for people using this drug for their non-COVID related conditions. And similarly, most states mandated that insurers allow early refills of medications to ensure continuity of care. So um, we will talk about some of these challenges, challenging topics and how uh, David and Randy and their organizations collaborated in responding to them. <clears throat> Quick note to the audience, if you have questions, please use the chat box, which I will monitor while I have a conversation with both David and Randy. And as they blend into some of the, the topics we were talking about, I'll try to blend in your questions to my questions. And at the end as well, uh, I hope we will be able to have some additional time for discussions. So with that, uh, let's start. And, and, and first I would like our presenters to Tell us a little bit about their own background and their role in their organizations. Randy, if you would like to go first and then, and then we could have their chime in. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everybody for having us. Um, like I said, my name is Randy Han. I'm the Vice President of Pharmacy at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. And I am a pharmacist and I've been in the managed care arena for over 20 years. I have background working as a retail pharmacist in a retail setting and then moving up into the managed care area. So managing the um, pharmacy contracts for large retailers, um, Meyer and Target, where my team negotiated all of the pharmacy contracts, managed the relationships with all of the, um, the PBMs um, in the country for those two organizations. I also have experience on the PBM side of the business, um, actually working with Prime Therapeutics 
in the past and then on the health plan side. So I've had on the sales side as well as on the, um, the clinical side of the health plan. Um, so my team within Blue Cross and Blue Shield manages the drug benefit. And the drug benefit really consists of two separate areas that work together. And that is the pharmacy benefit. So when you think about when you go into a retail pharmacy, take your prescription card in, get your prescription filled there, um, those are what, what I'll call the, the pharmacy benefit. So that is going to include your, your pills, creams, liquids. And on the specialty side of the retail benefit, that includes your high cost um, oral medications as well as uh, high cost injectables or, or self-injectable medications. When I talk about the medical side of the business, the medical side of the business is for your infused medications and your uh, physician or clinical, uh, admin clinically administered uh, injectable medications. And so my team manages the total drug benefit and does that for all of our lines of business within Blue Cross. So we manage the um, the commercial side, which includes the self-insured and fully insured business segments, as well as Medicare and Medicaid. And our team also manages the relationship with our PBM Prime Therapeutics, which we fortunately have an exceptional relationship with and very well aligned goals and objectives um, to really have holistic management of our members. Thank you, Randy. David? Yeah, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to have the time this afternoon to talk to you. Um, so my background is I had an undergrad in biology um, and then came to the University of Minnesota uh, School of Pharmacy uh, to get my PharmD, so Skyuma on that. And uh, I have been at Prime Therapeutics going on 22 years uh, this month. So it's been a great journey. Early in my career, prior to Prime Therapeutics, I was in the long-term care setting. Uh, but since coming to Prime, uh, working at a pharmacy benefit manager like Prime, uh, my roles evolved over time. And right now, my uh, primary accountabilities are to have responsibility for our overall clinical strategy. In a nutshell, what that means is really um, assessing a lot of the, the new medications, existing medications that are on the market. Um, and what we do is we develop the, um, all of the coverage uh, guidance uh, and strategy around how those individual therapies uh, will be covered and through uh, formularies, utilization management programs, benefit designs, um, all the way from the, you know, specific drug therapies themselves to more population health based clinical programs to improve things like adherence, um, reduction in, in opioid misuse and abuse, um, and overall, it's just improvement in outcomes. Our goal, like Randy said, is really to look at the total cost of care and total health care. So we really view pharmacy as an investment, um, if you will, into that total uh, health care arena. So uh, great to be with you today. Thank you so much. So um, I know you both sort of alluded to, you know, the, 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 how the organizations work together. But like if we go back to the pre-COVID-19 world, who wants to go back to the pre-COVID-19 world? <laughs> <laughs> um, how did your two organizations and, and your particular roles and, uh, in, like, typically work together? Um, what kind of decisions did you make together or what were some of the most challenging topics pre-COVID-19 world that you dealt, you, you dealt with together? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and start on and answer that question. So interestingly, uh, Blue Cross of Minnesota in partnership with Blue Cross of Nebraska actually started Prime Therapeutics back in 1998. So we have a long, long history of working together. Prime has, has grown to from just the two starting owner clients now have 18 owner clients um, and become one of the really the largest PBMs in the country. And we have, we've worked hand in hand in managing the, the drug benefit, like I said before, on the RX and on the medical side. And it, the, the benefit is, is that we, like I said, have aligned goals. We work very, very closely together, evaluating drugs, placement of drugs, where there's opportunity, because at the end of the day, we want to ensure that our, we have a holistic view of our members 
and that we're treating their condition for optimal outcomes. And we work very, very closely um, in a number of different areas to be able to address that. We, I guess if I, if I take a, a step back to the, um, at the very uh, first, I guess, um, clinic, is the clinical review of, of drugs. And so we work very closely with Prime and they manage and lead our um, pharmacy and therapeutics committee, which consists of all of the blues plans, medical directors, um, doctors um, to evaluate medications, at, you know, looking at the very deep clinical information um, and then come out of that with recommendations on how we should um, cover, cover medications. Then we have what's called our business committee, which is the 18 owner clients and their uh, pharmacy directors where we work collaboratively and evaluate drugs, determine again, the placement, um, and then we bring that information internally within our organization to our um, pharmacy and therapeutics uh, committee, which consists of our internal pharmacists, primes, um, clinical teams, and, oops, sorry, I had something pop up on my screen, um, and their, their clinical teams. And then we, then we go to our coverage committee, which consists of our medical directors. And really that's kind of the business, the financial decision-making uh, process. And so that's kind of the clinical side of the business, but then we also have um, teams within Prime that support each of our lines of business. So the Medicare, Medicaid, and um, the commercial lines of business. And we're, we're basically talking daily about how we manage the benefits for, for the members, where we have opportunities, um, any issues that come up. And so I, I would say it is an extremely, extremely collaborative relationship. And again, managing it across the pharmacy as well as the medical benefit. I don't um, know if there's anything you wanna add, David? Yeah, I was gonna ask yeah, the same question. Really, <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, well, well put, Randy. I, I would say, you know, Prime as a, as a PBM, is one of the differentiators of uniqueness in this market compared to like an Express Script, CVS, other competitors, is our model. Um, it's really an equity ownership model where we're, we're not publicly traded. Um, rather, uh, the CEOs of our Blue Cross Blue Shield plans like Blue Cross of Minnesota really comprise our board of directors. And as such, really kind of, I think, drive our work and investments really for the purposes of our clients and their members, and really all around doing that for ensuring access to the best medications. And I think um, Randy put it well, we collaborate uh, extremely well because really we are them, we were them at one point in time. Um, that's our pedigree is blue. So um, <laughs> it's a unique and it, it works well. Well, no, thank you. Um, so this was pre-COVID, uh, and hopefully we'll go back to those just days of daily interactions in the, <laughs> the way that Randy has described. But so after COVID, um, I don't know which one of you would like to take it first. I mean, a lot of things changed, but let's talk about regulations first. Um, like, so after COVID-19, how did the regulatory environment change at the federal and the state levels? And I know, David, you had shared a slide with me in our earlier exchanges as to the multitude of regulations. I don't know if Kim could, if you could maybe share that. Um, yeah, I don't know, Randy or uh, David. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start us out. So I think right af as COVID was emerging um, at, in the United States, um, you know what, there was a new paradigm that, that emerged overnight. I think the biggest paradigm was that the mandates for coverage of drugs was not evidence-based any longer. Um, pharmacists like Randy and I have a long track record with our organizations of really driving to an evidence-based medicine, right? Looking at those double-blind placebo-controlled studies that supported with FDA labeling or compendia to drive those medications which really offer the best uh, value and efficacy and safety that's, that's confirmed with, with trials and trial data. The new paradigm was that overnight, we were faced with uh, a scenario we'd never been faced with before, which is 
uh, in all likelihood, we would be covering medications perhaps um, that were either FDA, not FDA approved for this particular uh, virus or were not even prescription medications. They were investigational at this time. So right away, we had six FDA approved drugs immediately on a watch list that we were evaluating to track the utilization daily, all the trial data, um, thinking that they could be repurposed or used off label for purposes of the virus. Um, and that, that's unheard of, right? Um, similarly, there was roughly seven to 10 uh, non FDA approved drugs altogether, just investigational. Um, remdesivir that you, everyone knows about today uh, as, as the medication that they're using now in, in hospital setting um, is a good example of that, where nothing but investigal, investigational trials originally, and we've been watching that drug um, since March. So that was, I think, the, the paradigm that emerged overnight. And as you can see, that really resulted in um, over 200 uh, individual uh, legislative mandates, both at the federal and state level, uh, that just exploded with, with compliance and regulation and changes. So you have a very fluid situation on your hands in which covering medications and a pharmacy benefit for the uh, onset of COVID uh, really became a wild, wild west overnight and a new frontier where the rules of the rules of engagement changed and we had to adapt quickly uh, to this emerging scenario. One of the key, uh, several of the key things that the legislative and regulatory requirements were focused on for pharmacy uh, for COVID-19 were things like early refills, where that's a, we'll talk about in a little bit, but just allowing individuals to get their medication ahead of when they would normally uh, be entitled to go in and get a prescription renewed. Uh, things like opening up pharmacy networks so that you could go to a pharmacy out of network and get coverage for medication. Uh, removing things like formulary uh, coverage and UM program requirements, um, suspending any type of negative change uh, that would impact members and providers or cause abrasion in that regard. So those legislative uh, requirements, largely state-based, really started impacting our whole uh, construct of how we supply benefits and cover medications for our members. No, it's uh, it's just incredible the, the amount of change that is needed in, in such a short time period. And um, for, for me as a research researcher as well, as it's so interesting because I look at questions around evidence-based, you know, prescribing behavior and now the evidence is all over the place and it's just, it's incredible to kind of figure out um, how it's gonna match uh, going forward. Um, some trends that I'm definitely following myself in my research. Randy, did you wanna um, chime in on that from the Blue Cross Blue Shield's perspective as to the response or the immediate response to the regulation and that the regulatory activity? Well, you know, um, the only thing that I would really add is that, you know, it was it was changing so quickly and so fast that it, that we had to be working together um, very, very closely to in, in, to make the changes. Um, but I would say that our our first and foremost consideration was ensuring that members could get the medications that they needed with with as little interaction. Um, knowing that people were staying confined in their houses. And, and I think that that was probably the biggest thing that we um, focused on at the very, very beginning was just getting them their medications. Right. So we'll talk, uh, as um, David said, a little bit in more detail about some of mm -hmm. these regulations uh, in a bit. Um, but just a general question, you know, the federal guidances, state guidances, local guidances, were there a lot of discrepancies? Um, and if there were like, how do they interact with it from your organization's perspectives? So there were both federal guidance and, you know, that would uh, uh, CMS, for instance, Centers for Medicaid, and definitely proposed guidance around uh, the Medicare Part D business. Um, there was definitely federal guidance, but the majority of the guidance impacting all of the pharmacy benefit coverage uh, really was for the most part at the state level. And so what we saw was 
every state making decisions and slightly different um, iterations of those by state. Um, so on one hand, that posed a challenge from the perspective of uh, setting up the you know unique custom requirements by state across our book of business nationally. But on the other hand, I think it was very much in line with how we are set up to do business with our Blue Cross plans, which is a state-based business in many regards. So it allowed us to, I think, utilize our strengths and our ability in differentiating and customizing uh, unique benefit coverage requirements uh, within our systems and adjudication platforms uh, to enable compliance with those individual state mandates. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, now we are where we are, and there's a lot going on still. So are there any, uh, still in, around the theme of regulations, are there any uh, federal uh, or state regulations that, that are currently in the works that may have a large impact on either of your organizations? Or what, or what, what would they be if you were to kind of think about prioritizing them? Yeah, yeah the, the, probably the biggest one that uh, pending right now, uh, as many of you are probably aware, is the significant federal guidance ACIP and, and FDA have rolled out on the distribution of vaccines and preparing for that distribution. Um, it's a three-phase plan in which the idea is once the vaccines hopefully become available, um, those would be first rolled out to uh, the highest risk and uh, those in a, you know, basically needing the vaccine in healthcare administration and so forth. And then as that distribution of product gains momentum, uh, we would see largely the distribution start to happen outside of those more closed environments through the federal government, but through things like um, pharmacies. And as the distribution gets to its more status quo placed in phase three, we anticipate, and the federal government anticipates, that vaccine distribution through the pharmacy networks uh, will be the primary means for scaling up uh, to meet the dramatic need of vaccination uh, over the course of time. And so we're working really closely with our Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, really proactively uh, to prepare for what that might look like, setting up coverage drug lists, working with our network pharmacies, how they're going to store those vaccines, how, we're, how those vaccines will be billed. Uh, will the federal government pay for those? That's still to be determined and how that would work and for how long. Um, so there's a lot going on in terms of, once again, being prepared and proactive, uh, anticipating that very soon we will be a, playing a major role uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, in the vaccination program. And Randy, did you want to add more to that? Well, you know, the, I guess what I would add too is that the good thing is, is that we are, Prime already has vaccine networks set up um, that we can build through the pharmacy system. And so I think that that's going to help um, ease that transition and minim, minimize the burden of, of any technology changes or things that need to happen in order for us to be able to ramp up actually very, very quickly. So I, I think that that's great. We're, we're well positioned to be able to address that as we go forward. Right. Um, so I want to deep dive on a few topics, but before that, I would like to extend an invitation to the audience again. If you have questions to our uh, presenters, please use the chat box and, and I will try to, you know, either compile them to ask at the end or, um, and, or blend them to my own questions as we go along. Um, so one question just came, uh, are you gathering data on all of this critical information? Absolutely. We, from the beginning, um, data-driven approach was critical in terms of understanding the utilization patterns of, of emerging medications being used, um, understanding the overall impact to members, how many members are, are refilling prescriptions, and we'll show that in a little bit. Um, but I think also just, just understanding how overall drug costs are being impacted, new prescriptions versus refills, um, and making sure uh, the double-edged sword, that we're using data 
to make sure everyone can have access to appropriate therapy while at the same time mitigating um, overuse or inappropriate stockpiling during a time where that would not be good. Right. So I have two other questions. One is uh, asking about telemedicine, the other about early refill. Two topics that I want to talk in, um, in, a, in, a, in a short while anyway. So I'll hold on to those questions. And, and then I will, um, maybe, maybe Randy, uh, you may be able to get us started in this idea around coverage and utilization management. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you typically make utilization management decisions on particular drugs? And again, like how did your organization kind of make coverage decisions with all the uncertain and quickly changing evidence? Um, you know, like my example in my mind is hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine guidelines and remdesivir guidelines. Uh, what kind of decisions did you have to make? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you. So first I, you know, we were very collaborative, like I said before, in, in determining coverage of, of medications. Now, pharmacy is a little bit different than on the medical side because on the pharmacy side of the business, we um, rely on FDA approval for medications covered under the pharmacy benefit. Under the medical benefit, the um, emergency use authorizations, the EUAs, um, added, like David said earlier, a complexity, a new complexity that we haven't had to deal with in the past. And so we were covering medications that weren't necessarily FDA approved, that they were still investigational. So there was a lot of conversation going on around that. But I think the, the big thing um, is, is around the utilization management because you know, like I said at the beginning, we wanted to make sure that people had access to their medications. And, and I will say probably that one of the biggest concerns when COVID hit was that there was going to be a run on certain medications. There wasn't going to be product in the marketplace. And so we had to really think about how we best manage those to ensure that there was still product available for our members um, and, and not putting too many constraints on those. So you know, thinking about utilization management, um, I just want to take a brief second to explain, you know, really what utilization management is. And it's really a, a number of techniques used to ensure appropriateness of therapy, safety, and cost effectiveness of any of the drug therapies. Um, utilization management, we always, first and foremost, it is absolutely based on the clinical evidence. Um, we look at FDA approval, effectiveness of the medications, um, you know, other drugs in within the class before we make any any decisions. So there's a number of tools that that we utilize that will help us ensure that the right member is getting the right drug at the right place, the right dose, the right time, right duration, all of the you know the seven rights, um, and at the right cost because that's our responsibility um, is to. Um, manage our members' healthcare uh, to the lowest net cost. And so a few of the tools that we utilize is prior authorization. And, and, and I'll say one of the things that we had done, uh, because prior authorization sometimes gets, uh, it, it, it is in the marketplace as maybe a negative thing, but what prior authorization is, is it is a evaluation of a particular drug to be able to ensure all of those seven, the seven rights that the right member is getting the right drug to treat their condition because a lot of these medications have pretty significant side effect profiles, have very limited dose ranges. And so it's really for the benefit of the member, the patient to ensure that we're getting them the right, the right medication to treat their condition. And if they don't have that particular condition, um, then they shouldn't be getting that particular medication. And when we're talking about medications that you know, nowadays we, you know, we, we've had the highest number of new drugs hitting the market over the past two years in all of history. And so, and some of these medications are up in the one to two, even $3 million per dose range. So it's critical that we're, we're managing and ensuring that the right members are getting the right, those right drugs. So prior authorization was one of the things that we had actually uh, pushed off until later in the year because of COVID, because we didn't want our members to have to go through uh, that additional evaluation for the medication, as well as um, the physicians having to, to do more, because we wanted them to be focusing on those, those COVID uh, positive patients and treating, treating them. A few of the other tools that we have our techniques is, you know, step therapy. If there's a list of medications that are, that 
treat the same condition and there's some that are less expensive, others that are more expensive, that we have members try those, those lower cost medications because they've been proven to be equally effective as the higher cost. Um, so that's, that's a technique. And then, you know, we, we implement quantity limits, um, you know, meaning within a, you know, a 30 day supply, a member can only get a certain number of, med of, of pills. Um, and then day supply limits um, as well. So in a situation where we wanna make sure that if a member's getting like a 30 day supply of medication that they have to ensure that they've gone through, you know, 22 days or 21 or 22 days of that medication before they can get their next fill. So they're not stockpiling, um, stockpiling medication. Yeah, <laughs> related. I guess that follows us onto the next, qu next one. Um, so I, I know, David, you alluded to this earlier. So one of the things was about uh, the refill too soon edits. If you could maybe uh, say a little bit more about this concept of early ref refills and emergency dispensing and how the regulation, I mean, how did they work in the pre-COVID world? And then what happened post-COVID? And what were sure. the implications on, on utilization of lifting some of these edits and any unintended effects like stockpiling could be one of the things that come to my mind. And one specific question to this uh, that came from one of the participants is that under what circumstances would a patient still get denied for early refill? And the participants, as I assume, people can't just stock up all their refills. So if you could give a general sort of pre-COVID definition of this concept and how it changed post-COVID. Sure. So pre-COVID, we have uh, what are called early uh, or refill uh, edits in the system. Basically, what that does is in the claim adjudication system for pharmacy, um, it ensures that about 60 to 75 percent of the day supply of a prescription is used by the member before they can refill the prescription. So if they were going to try to refill the prescription early, um, it would tell the pharmacist in a pharmacy that it's too soon um, until they meet that um, requirement of day supply. And so during the times of uh, scenarios, whether it be hurricanes or other natural disasters, it's a common, uh, common procedure or standard for us to lift those uh, refill limits to allow for our members to have access to drug therapy uh, sooner than uh, they normally would in an imminent scenario. Um, typically that's done in a more targeted manner regionally throughout the United States. What was unique when COVID hit is we were actually in a scenario where uh, we were being potentially asked to lift refill requirements across the board for all members, for all blue plans. Um, and the concern obviously was this was early March. Uh, and at that time, China, which was still coming um, back online from their lockdown, um, had basically a, the majority of their raw materials uh, supporting the supply chain uh, for things like generic products, which are about 90% of our prescriptions. Um, those, those APIs, they're called, um, are are really what was our biggest concern in that we were, we were thinking there was a high likelihood of a complete or catastrophic um, supply chain degradation uh, for generic medications because of the raw materials and the plants being closed in China. As a result, our early on position was let's be very targeted and be very careful where we lift those early refills um, because we want to make sure that it's in those areas that we know are for sure in a, um, a scenario where COVID is growing rapidly. However, um, as it turned out, uh, national guidance as well as state level guidance really took off and it really became a national requirement to lift those refill edits across the board. Thankfully, at that same time, the China plants uh, for all the raw materials started coming back online, um, which prevented, I think, and really mitigated that uh, potential scenario from occurring. So that was really good. If we have the um, ch chart up, we do, I just point you to the fact that this was a look at claims over time 
And you can see at the beginning of March when those early uh, refills were requirements were lifted, the refill claim count in dark blue, that top line, went up dramatically, you know, likely 20 percentage points from baseline. And then as you see, it came down back to baseline fairly quickly by April. What you'll note is in the gray line is new fills. Those are new prescriptions. So when you think about prescriptions, there's always prescriptions being refilled and those that are new. And again, <laughs> anticipatory nature of, of the onset of the virus caused many to go out and get new prescriptions as well as um, refills. And some of the new prescriptions may have been those, in fact, for things like hydroxychloroquine, right? Um, and, and then there was this dramatic drop off, right? Where you see a 13% decrease in new fill counts. That has come back now over the summer, close back to baseline, um, which is good. And so all of this has really come back to almost what it was pre-COVID. Um, but the obvious concerns here are, you know, what medications weren't taken during that time period and what, what would that mean longer term from a total cost of care and health outcomes perspective if people weren't adhering to their diabetes medications, for instance. So there's a lot of work and analysis going on looking at, at that. Um, the good news is uh, we were able to ensure getting access uh, for our Blue Cross members, as well as um, we avoided uh, a, a complete supply chain um, catastrophe. Yeah. Randy, um, from your point of view, what kind of strategies did you take to approach preventing some of this overutilization and stockpiling? And as we Look at this chart, this sharp drop. What are you guys thinking about that? Well, we, we monitored it very closely. We were getting reports on a daily basis of prescriptions that were being filled early. We were looking at uh, ensuring that members weren't stockpiling. Um, Prime put edits in place to be able to really prevent that, that it would look back to ensure that they weren't getting too much medication. We, we focused on specialty medications and, and opioid medications, um, just to make sure that there wasn't any um, fraud or waste or abuse going on within. Uh, so, but because we had great data coming from Prime, we were able to monitor that very, very closely. Yeah. Um, so another regulatory question, I'll take one from the audience. Um, moving past the current pandemic, do you think that the regulatory changes made to address and respond to COVID will continue to be used? Or do you think that the regulatory guidelines will go back to how they were pre-COVID? So we're already seeing um, a, a mix of things going back to pre-COVID. So for instance, the early refill requirements that were put in place in March ended for most of our uh, blue plans and states by the end of July or end of June. Um, and so many of those have gone back to normal. Um, coverage requirements similarly. Uh, but I think there will be a continuation of, um, you know, things that don't go back to normal. And I think this whole experience for all of us has been one of the new normal. And I think the new normal for us will be um, apart from some of the working conditions, even of our call centers and staff working from home overnight. Um, but from a compliance standpoint, I think there will be a heightened sense of uh, coverage for COVID-19 medications in the future, as the pipeline probably will continue to evolve. Like I said, with vaccines, I think you're gonna see a continuation of heavy guidance and regulation there. Uh, from the federal government uh, as those are rolled out. Um, and I think the states will continue uh, to monitor. And, you know, depending, everyone's talking about the second peak, the third peak. Uh, and, you know, I think the question on our minds is, will the states ever go back to requirements uh, that were originally put in place to begin with around some of those early refills? I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, but again, we, we have to continue to be proactive and, and monitoring that state legislation all the time uh, in coordination with our, with our Blue Plan partners. Yeah, um, Randy, I don't know if you wanted to add to that regulatory perspective. 
Well, and, and maybe not necessarily from a regulatory perspective, but if you think about some of the things that happened with COVID, where members, you know, we encouraged members to not, we, you know, limit, lifted the refill too soon edits, but we also encouraged the use of, of mail order. Um, you know, the, some of the retail pharmacies were uh, delivering free of charge when they were charging previously. Now, I don't know if they'll continue to do that, but that may become something that uh, changes over time. We may see continued use of, of mail order where there hasn't been, like I said, the um, significant use of mail. Um, but I think that those are just a couple of things that we could see change, you know, going forward because of COVID. Right. Um, so I'll make a pause again and invite um, the audience to send in more questions. I have one more topic I would like to talk with David and Randy, which is on telehealth. Um, actually, a little bit on drug shortages as well. I know we talked about it. Uh, David, you alluded to the drug shortages. And I wanted to just in general to see um, like what were some of the early concerns and how did you approach that surveillance and mitigation strategies? Um, the, or how was your collaboration affected or how did you collaborate um, during that time of possible drug shortages because of China, as you mentioned, David? Yeah, so one of the things we had to do was really on a, uh, you know, almost a multiple times a day, uh, really be in close connection with our supply chain um, and that being the wholesalers, the pharmacy network, uh, uh, key uh, leadership, uh, as well as our drug manufacturers and all of our contacts and network with drug manufacturers. Those three uh, legs on a stool really comprised our daily assessment of the extent to which we were getting notified if there was an impending drug shortage um, so that we could take actions to prepare and work with our Blue Cross plans um, to mitigate that. Um, one of those was around albuterol from an inhaler perspective. Randy, I don't know from your perspective if, uh, from, you know, how that went from Blue Cross's perspective, but that may be something you could speak to a little bit. Yeah, that, and that was a really um, interesting situation because, you know, we had albuterol inhalers um, on our formulary. So we would, we would cover only a certain uh, drug manufacturers of uh, albuterol inhalers. Uh, what we found was is that some of those manufacturers had uh, were the ones that were having the drug shortages, and so what we had what we did is we actually took medications that were non-formulary medications, quickly put them on our formulary so that members wouldn't be negatively impacted. So, if they went into the pharmacy to get an albuterol inhaler, they could get any of the albuterol inhalers that were basically available on the market. That, that is something that I, I would say, as long as I've been in this business, we've never ever done before in the past. And so that, that was a new unique situation that we had to work through. Uh, and again, you know, because we're, we, we work so closely with Prime, they were able to respond to that very quickly. Um, and we had really minimal member impact because of that. That's very interesting. Um, so um, moving on to sort of the telehealth as one of the, you know, the signature changes of COVID-19, and a lot of people are pursuing it in a very positive way. Um, how is your organization responding to the expansion of telehealth? Yeah, I, you know, within Blue Cross, I, it, it was a dramatic, dramatic change. You know, as we look back into 2019, um, I'm, we did about 66,000 telehealth visits, uh, and that was in all of 2019. And from March, m middle of March to the end of June, we did almost 900,000 telehealth visits. Um, and so, and you know, I, I would say that telehealth, as you can tell, really didn't have significant uptake. Uh, and I think that that is going to be a, a change that we'll see going forward, that people found it very beneficial, that it was easy to use, um, they got great medical information, um, and, and I, I believe that we'll see telehealth continuing to uh, grow um, from, you know, the, from the 2019. I don't think it'll be the same as, as what we saw for those first few months of COVID, but um, I think we'll, we will see a dramatic change in telehealth going forward. 
And um, does this expansion of telehealth change the way prime therapeutics and glucose blue shield work together in any way? I don't think so. And the reason for that is, is because the, it's between the member and the physician that are having that interaction. If the physician prescribes a, a drug, you know, they, they'll just send it electronically to one of our pharmacies and then Prime will adjudicate that claim. So I don't think it will affect the relationship um, that we have with Prime, uh, but, but we'll, um, what do you think, David? I would agree. I think we would largely play a supportive role. Um, you had mentioned, Randy, about the increase probably in mail order uh, type of, uh, prescriptions. But I think beyond that, it's really something we would, we would simply um, support at, on an as needed basis. So um, telehealth is one of these, but one of the questions that we got is with this new world, um, what do you think are some of the key positive changes, telehealth being one of the examples, which will continue to stay um, as, as for the benefit of your members? and the supportive care providers. One positive change that I think isn't necessarily unique to Prime or Blue Cross, uh, but we definitely were impacted is um, our CEO coming on board uh, knew about uh, 18 months ago, uh, set, a, set a goal. That goal to be have 50% of Prime Therapeutics working um, in an at-home scenario uh, with, by 2023. Um, when COVID came, um, that seemed like a daunting goal, by the way. When COVID came, within one week, um, you know, you have over 4,000 people working from home immediately. Our contact center, call centers, all of our uh, distribution areas uh, working from home. Again, it's not unique to Prime or Blue Cross. Uh, but I think what is what is good is that we actually showed uh, we didn't lose ground, right? In fact, we saw increased productivity in some of our productionized areas. Um, and, and that, I think, is a dramatic uh, thing to watch, and I think it will impact us long term. What do you think, Randy? Some of the positive things. Well, I think just the, the flexibility, the understanding that you know these types of things come out of nowhere and can happen and just being able to be flexible and being able to respond quickly uh, with with our members in mind first and foremost is uh, not that it not that it, our members aren't always at first of mind but just being able to respond as quickly as we did on so many different fronts you know having to deal with covid having to be working remote um, and all of those things, I, it was a testament to just the, the execution and flexibility uh, between the organizations and not just our organizations, but the industry to be able to um, accomplish what we did. Um, one, one question from the audience is um, thinking about the post-COVID world and expanding on telehealth. Are you looking to get connections into medical records to expedite patient care? such as reduce the burden of prior authorization to improve health outcomes. Yeah, go ahead, David. No, go ahead, Randy. Okay, well, what I was gonna say is, is that we are already working um, to uh, incorporate the, the medical record in the, in the EMR to be able to real-time benefit check. And what that's going to do is it's going to be able to allow the physician at point of sale through their EMR as they're looking to prescribe a medication for a member, it will bump up against the, that member's benefit plan to see whether the medication is covered, whether the medication it requires a prior authorization or whether it's not covered. And if it's not covered, what are some alternative medications? Because I think that that's going to be the, the key to get that to the physician, because then they'll be able to prescribe the right medication and minimize their impact because they won't have to go and do a, a prior authorization um, after the member or put the member in the middle and the me member goes to the pharmacy to get their prescription and they have to wait because the pharmacy has to call the doctor to get a prior authorization and all of that. I think that um, the real-time benefit check is going to be a huge benefit for to really to minimize the physician impact as well as the member impact. 
Yeah, I also think that we have a, an opportunity, even coming up with vaccines, to utilize the integration between um, the health plan, Blue Cross, and, and Prime Therapeutics and the data that we have. So part of our unique connection is integrated medical and pharmacy claims data. Uh, so things like we, even with vaccine distribution, uh, we have an opportunity to contemplate, hey, can we help the pharmacy networks and the downstream pharmacies identify and prioritize high-risk members uh, who may need distribution of products sooner versus others? With the nature of this disease, it's become pretty clear uh, those that are at more high risk. And so there may be an opportunity in that first phase as we're looking at the slower distribution to help with the prioritization process as an example. That's great. So I will have, um, we have just a few more minutes left. I will have one last call to the audience if they want to ask a question. And while maybe I, I see if the audience will come up with questions. I wanna go back to something we discussed before and actually you just mentioned this, David, about the vaccines and um, and it kind of it might, in my general, in my head, it's more around the, what are some of the things in the works that is sort of upcoming and brewing that? Um, so from both of your perspectives, what is the biggest uncertainty that you have, you wish was resolved as early as possible? Can I just ask a clarifying question? Is that regarding COVID or just COVID. in general? Yes, yes. COVID related. Um, it, it could be like something on the regulatory side or something on R and D, or you know. So, what what will be? What are some of the one or two you know biggest uncertainties that would be really helpful for your business right now if it was solved? Well, I think first and foremost is to have a, a vaccine that is actually effective and available um, is is probably the biggest concern, um, at least on the on the health plan side. Um, I think the other things regarding, you know, the, the new medications and, and how we cover those, what is, what are the new things that are going to be coming out and what are the costs going to be just really managing the cost of these. Um, and then I think the, the last one is um, just a re regarding testing, because there's, you know, all the different tests out there. There's the, um, you know, the antibody tests, the actual tests, um, just getting to consistency and having a truly, truly effective test um, is, is are some of the things that at least that we're, we think about. And how do we cover those? You know, how often do you cover those, um, you know, as a health plan? Because people, you know, if you're a pro athlete, you're getting basically tested every day before you do anything. And as a plan, would we, would we be required to pay for them, you know, daily or monthly or just once? You know, I, those are just some of the things that we think about. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's really good. I, you know, I, I would say a couple other things. Maybe one is just overall the impact of COVID-19 um, on the livelihood. Um, and so uh, we work with many employer groups, large employer groups. And, um, you know, as, as the question of how many uninsured will, will be as a result of this, how many lives in employer groups will will decrease. Um, and so I think that's a, a larger macro kind of economic question uh, around the whole, you know, healthcare and insurance org organizations that we look at, and particularly those like us that are forecasting uh, costs and risk risks into the future. Uh, it's hard to know uh, what that future is going to look like. Um, just in terms of cost utilization and just how many lives we'll be um, seeking and, and able to have insurance in that regard specific to COVID. So, um, you know, I think the vaccine piece, uh, Randy said it spot on, uh, the, the question mark still for us is how much will the federal government uh, help subsidize and in that process um, and, and and how will that be done? What's the process for that? How will that payment come? Um, I think it's still a question mark. And so as we are close to that, hopefully time period where we're gonna see the uh, efficacy uh, safety trials for those phase three studies and gain confidence that we've got a couple vaccines that are going into distribution here 
uh, hopefully in the near future, um, that will be a, a, a definitely pending question. No, I absolutely agree. And um, lots of uncertainties and, and hopefully they will be resolved very soon. And, and uh, some of these positive changes that you discussed, both of you discussed, and I hope they stay and uh, they impact you know, patient outcomes in the positive way. Well, I want to thank you both so much for, um, for joining our conversations and, um, and, and giving us insights and, and honest insights on both the challenges and, and where some of the most difficult decisions you have to make, as well as uh, highlighting where, how your collaboration has really have been impactful in, in solving some of these uh, challenges. And um, we have, um, some nice comments from some of the audience and positive feedback and, and lots of thanking and great information to the panelists. So, so thank you very much. Um, and um, thank you to our audience for joining us. And, and thank you, BAM and members of the Business School Alliance for Health Management for supporting this initiative. Um, and I hope to stay in touch with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a very nice day. Thank you day. so much.